Welcome to Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire, where authors talk about things that never happened to people who don't exist. We also cover craft, the agent hunt, query trenches, publishing industry, marketing, and more. I'm your host, Mindy McGinnis. You can check out my books and social media at mindymcginnis.com. And make sure to visit the Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire blog for additional interviews, query critiques, and more at writerwriterpantsonfire.com. Make your pages look professional with vellum. Margins, headers, page numbering, font, line spacing, all happen automatically with every book you create. Generate eBooks for Kindle, Apple Books, Kobo, and others, or deliver a beautiful print book to your readers. Visit trivellum.com forward slash pants to learn more. Vellum, create beautiful books. We're here with Dina Brumfield to talk about Unbound, a tale of love and betrayal in Shanghai. So first of all, why don't you talk a little bit about your personal background and some of the elements from your own life that helped inspire you to write this book? This book is very, very intimate accounts of my and people around me, their life. So I was born in China, in Shanghai, and I was raised there, lived in a time, basically, China was closed off to the entire world. In the time that I was in China, um, China went through a lot of change from entirely closed to slowly open up. Eventually, I left China to join my family in 1989. You can figure that English is my second language. So I came over here, um, had a very limited language skill, and I never thought I would write a book in English, of course. I mean, I, I always inspired to be a writer when I was a kid, but I thought I would write in Chinese. I thought, you know, the dream to be a, to be a writer is just pretty much dead. I mean, it's, it's impossible for me to make it become reality. Mm-hmm. However, the life that I had in China, somehow it just stayed with me. During the time I'm here, I've been here more than 30 years. So I went back to China several times, talked to people there, the young people there. China went through a huge change since I left. Basically, I raised them to a wood player, pretty much on an equal footing with us now. I talked to young people. They said, oh, what are you talking about? Like a so far-fetched story to them. And it wasn't that long ago. I said, like, oh, my God, it's only 30 years and people forgot. So that's why I, I feel like I'm compelled to write a story, as I said, loosely based on my life and also people around me. The reason I do that is because I think that history shouldn't be forgotten. Only when you remember the history, there is a less chance for history to repeat itself. It is about two very strong women, a granddaughter and, and grandmother who lived in 1970s and 1930s Shanghai. By the way, 70s Shanghai and, and, and the 30s Shanghai is two completely different world. And they struggle to free themselves from, you know, visible and invisible bonds. You know, I'm not a, a seasoned writer and English is my second language. So it was very difficult for me to write. So I didn't have like a preconceived outline as how the story should go. You know, I'm not, I wasn't very sophisticated. I'm still not very sophisticated in, come to, in, in terms to writing. But somehow this book, I guess it's from my heart. Mm-hmm. I touched a, a lot of issues, like women's rights, like freedom. These issues are still very relevant in today's world. So talk to me a little bit about English being your second language and writing a novel in your second language. I'm sure that really produces a whole slew of complications and just an added layer of difficulty for you. Did you write it in Chinese first and then translate it? Or did you just dive in and begin writing it in English? I started it in English. Actually, I'm in no man's land right now. So uh, after 30 years in the United States, I don't say my English is great, but my Chinese is terrible too. So ah. uh, 
<laughs> I forgot. My writing in Chinese becomes really difficult now, so I really appreciate the, the Chinese computer and the, the Chinese apps I can look up. But I, anyway, yes, I started in English、uh, when I start writing a book, and when I started, I just wrote one page, just the first thing of my book, because that thing was my experience, and I lived through it. So after all these years, I still could see it. So I took a writing class, and the teacher says, "Well, you write something. Write one page." So I said, "Well, what am I supposed to write?" But I could see my experience. Actually, it's almost like very visual, like a picture. In so I just wrote what I saw, and the teacher says, "Actually, it's really good. I need a lot of you know cleaning up, of course." But he actually liked what I wrote, so that was the starting point of my book. How old were you then when you decided to sit down and begin this process? Forties. I was raising my son at the time. My job it just didn't work out as the way I wanted. I used to live in California, then I moved to DC, and my company let me take my job with me, so I worked remotely. But over the time, I I did that for about like five six years. Over the time, the company went through reorg, and I wasn't in the office, and so I was disconnected with office politics. and And as a result, they just dumped me into some corner. I thought, "Heck, you know, I'm just going to quit." My husband says, "You always want a book, write a book. Maybe it's time for you to try." I said, "Are you kidding? I cannot do that. I just don't have the skill. It's impossible."、Mm -hmm. He said, "Okay,、mm -hmm. try it. Try it. You don't know until you try it." So that's how I sign up for, for the writing class, and that's how I started. So coming back to the book, one of the things that's really interesting about it is that it has two different timelines. It's set in 1930s and in 1980s in Shanghai. So writing about those two different time periods and how different China was in 50 years. Can you talk a little bit about that? About writing the two different timelines and kind of exploring those differences in the same setting. Yeah, actually, this is the interesting part of the book. Well, nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, I'm very familiar with it because I lived through it. That wasn't difficult for me all these years. I still can see what Shanghai was like when I lived there. However, 1930s is entirely different story because 1930s Shanghai、uh, was called the Paris of the East. It was booming city, and it was full of nightlife. You know, a lot of foreigners there. And Shanghai was in 1930s. Shanghai was divided by different countries. You know, they have、uh, foreign concessions. So they、mm -hmm. have a、uh, Chinese concession, French concession, British concession. Uh, the foreign concession, even they have a lot of similarities, but because they are different cultures, so each concession is different. Their architecture is different, and the restaurants they are different, and of course, people live there are different. You know, it, it was very interesting China, and and I heard a lot of stories from my grandma about 1930s Shanghai, but. You know, I didn't live there. I I I couldn't feel it. I couldn't touch it. You know, just、uh, quite removed from me. So I was thinking, hmm, how I can bring that up to paper and to life. Unfortunately, I live in D.C., so I went to Library of Congress. So and they have an Asian reading room, and and when I talk to the librarian about my book, about what I wanted to do, he said, Oh, I know what you need to do. So he pulled me to the corner, and he gave me a lot of old newspapers about China. What they call microfish. You can see the image of nineteen、uh、thirties -huh. China. So I basically just engrossed in that thing for a month. I, I every day I go there, like I go to work, and I just you know visualize and see and read the news and see the image of people, how they walk, and what the city looks like, and. Just over and over and over and over, and then I eventually I could could see a picture of that time in Shanghai, and that's how I started. Going back then, just to those time jumps, nineteen thirties, and then to nineteen eighties, and then again 
just it's not necessarily part of the book, but here today, China, of course, is greatly changed again. So do you see any relevance then between your book and what is happening in China today? Can you talk about like the timeliness of your novel? I'm not a political person, but I see a lot of similarities. In 1930s, women, I'm, I'm talking, this book is mo- mostly about women. Their life is very restricted. I mean, they don't have a lot of freedom. Everything is basically determined for them. Although in 1930s, it was a lot less common, but still, some women still have bonded feet. That's a lot of physical restriction posed on women. The, the book is, is about a grandmother, and she lived in the 1930s, and she tried to find love for herself, which failed, of course. Then she tried to break through what imposed on her and, and to find a freedom. In the course of looking for freedom, she sacrificed a lot. She had to abandon her daughter. In my time, in 1970s, women had a lot more power then we were equal we could go to school um we could go to college you know we could get pretty much all the jobs men could get however the the restriction posted on us is not man and woman by then it's all political we mm. uh, had to toe the party line we couldn't do a lot of things that we wanted to do we couldn't even dress the way that we wanted to dress we couldn't listen to the music we wanted to listen. And we had no freedom to pursue what we want to do, after, even, even after you go to college, because job was assigned to you. So there, there, there's a lot of restrictions. As a result, in the, the character in my book, Team, she left the country to pursue her own freedom. Today, people seem like they have so much freedom. They have a lot more money in their pocket. They could travel the world. They could do a lot of things that I couldn't do. However, they still have the toad line. Mm-hmm. They cannot say, they cannot openly, you know, express their idea if it's not in line with the party line. Mm-hmm. And they still have to be very, very careful. So otherwise, you just don't know what, what's going to happen to you. The security law they passed in Hong Kong, I, I, I was so sad. You know, that just opens the door for people could Go to your home, take your parents away for no reason. And then mm-hmm. they slap something on you, says, oh, you say something against our security law, whatever. China has changed a lot on surface, but deep in core, um, I'm not saying the same. I'm, I'm sure step forward, but it still had, ha, has a lot of similarities. Mm-hmm. So that's why I think my book touched upon that subject. Tune in to the Choose Your Struggle podcast for in-depth interviews featuring guests with lived experience on the topics of mental health, substance misuse and recovery, and drug use. Experience their stories to help end stigma and normalize difficult conversations through empathy and vulnerability. Each year, over 125,000 Americans die from overdose and suicide combined. These deaths are completely preventable, but until we can have honest conversations around these topics, these lives will continue to be lost. Listen in to help end the stigma and ensure that those who need help get the help they deserve, because we're in this together. Tune in to the Choose Your Struggle podcast. Help end child hunger simply by drinking coffee. Free Lunch Coffee is on a mission to end child hunger from the world. Because when a child doesn't have to worry about their next meal, they can focus on improving their natural gifts and talents to make a real difference in the world. With every bag of coffee you buy from Free Lunch Coffee, you are supporting a child to get a meal for two weeks. Free Lunch Coffee gives away 50% of the money they make to end hunger in the lives of underprivileged children. Their coffee is specialty grade, certified organic, and fair trade, all while offering a 100% money back guarantee for 30 days. My listeners can receive a 10% discount. Just use coupon code FIRE for a 10% discount at freelunchcoffee.com. 
And like you said, it is focused on women and female characters. So can you talk a little bit specifically about the woman's life then in China in the 1930s versus the 1980s and the difference specifically for females? In 1930s China, even though Shanghai is very modern at the time, very modern metropolitan, the core was still very restrictive for women. They cannot date, they cannot marry somebody they love, Mm -hmm. and the marriage is mostly arranged by family, and in some cases arranged when they were just born. And the most women at the time, they didn't go to school. A lot of women at the time couldn't read and write. When they were at home, their fate was controlled by their fathers. When they married, after they married, their fate was controlled by their husbands. They mm-hmm. had no rights. And if they have a children and the husband divorce you and you don't get your children, the children automatically belongs to husband's family. Mm-hmm. So... You're nothing. Um, so most divorce was unthinkable back then. There is a saying in China, it's like, a, you marry chicken, you go with chicken, you marry dog, you go with dog. So if you married, you married. Doesn't matter who you married to, you're going to stick for the lifetime, whether you're happy or not. Women had no education. That's why my character was was very unusual. And she not only choose her own lover to marry, and she actually decided to divorce him. Of course, she had to sacrifice a lot. Mm-hmm. But yeah, she was very strong and she stood up for herself. And 1980s woman, as I said, on the surface, during Mao's time, and he was really promoting equal rights for women, although it was not entirely equal. Because I remember when I was a kid, their salaries are determined by government. My dad's salary was higher than my mom's. So mm-hmm. I guess that wasn't equal, even though my mom was a very skilled surgical nurse. So when I growing up, I didn't feel a lot of restrictions. I went to school with boys. I went all the way through and I took the college examination and I went to college just like any other boys. Not so much restriction for girls, but the restriction is more on large scale as a system, systematic repression basically imposed on everyone, not just girls. I left China for 30 years. Now I'm looking at the Chinese government. There are quite a few powerful women there. And I look at the business, and it seems like there are quite a few women there. But I think that over the time, women they in China, they didn't elevate themselves quite a bit. Sexism, it's it's much less, and I think um, they provide the opportunity for women to moving up. So long mm-hmm. you toe the line, you Wonderful. have to toe the party line. Unbound is your first novel, and of course, highly personal to you, and has so many elements of your own life and the lives of the people around you. It took you 10 years to write and publish this book. And because it is so intensely personal, do you have any plans to continue on uh, writing more novels or uh, working more in the publishing arena? Being a writer has been my dream. And now I actually can hold my book. It's quite amazing. Yeah, I think I will write more. But a lot of people ask me if I'm going to write a sequel. I'm not sure about that. Mm. Um, but I, I'm writing um, my second book is already um I finished the first draft on my second book, but I'm not happy with it. So it might take mm-hmm. me another like five, six years to write it. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. But yes, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue to write. That's wonderful. And you are right about holding your book. Uh, it is a wonderful moment to see something that was mostly in your mind. And as you were saying before, it's it's like a series of pictures For me, too, it's very visual. It's like a movie in my head. And when you've moved that out into the world and it's a physical thing that you can hold, it's a very, very cool feeling. It is. I I cried. Yeah, I think I probably did, too, to be honest with you. Uh, That first novel is so special in so many ways. And yours, particularly because it's so personal. 
Y- yes, it is very personal. So hopefully, second novel is not going to be personal. And I'm actually decided to write a different stories. I have a couple of stories in my head, so some will be a lot of lot more fun, less heavy. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Last thing, why don't you tell us where listeners can find you online and where they can buy the book? My book is it's a historical book and a lot of uh, you know historical facts are very unfamiliar to people in this country. So mm-hmm. I I actually on my website dinabrumfield.com, I put some background to help readers to understand my book. So you can look for dinabrumfield.com. And also I have Facebook, Instagram, under my name, Dina Brumfield. Make your pages look professional with vellum. Margins, headers, page numbering, font, line spacing, all happen automatically with every book you create. Generate eBooks for Kindle, Apple Books, Kobo, and others, or deliver a beautiful print book to your readers. Visit trivellum.com forward slash pants to learn more. Vellum. Create beautiful books. Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire is produced by Mindy McGinnis. Music by Jack Corbel. Don't forget to check out the blog for additional interviews, writing advice, and publication tips at writerwriterpantsonfire.com. If the blog or podcast have been helpful to you, or if you just enjoy listening, please consider donating. Visit writerwriterpantsonfire.com and click support the blog and podcast in the sidebar. <laughs>